Hello, and um, welcome to the final installment, oh, you can't see the cover, of uh, AP Lit Summer Reading. I'm going to read the Stephen Greenblatt selections today, um, selections from Renaissance Self-Fashioning, from Moore to Shakespeare, which is, I don't know, I never really think much about the subtitle. Anyway, it's not so important to our uh, reading and thinking today. Um, okay, so we have the preface, the introduction, and the epilogue, and um, I'm really excited to get into this with you all today. So get your books out, read along, um, pen in your hand or pencil, and your commonplace book handy, and be ready to take some notes and make some questions and follow along. Um, all right, this is my copy. It's thoroughly annotated, underlined. Got lots of sticky notes from previous class readings and my own readings. Um, yeah, all right, so I'm gonna start at the top of the preface. Um, Since Renaissance Self-Fashioning was a book in which I first found my own voice, it would be pleasant to claim that it was the fruit of deep architectonic design, shaped according to a master scheme. Unfortunately, it was not. The book came about in a somewhat haphazard way, driven by the local opportunities that happened to spring up at that early point in my career. Two different invitations to the English Institute, a challenging occasion to present a talk before an engaged and skeptical audience, triggered essays on Marlowe and on Othello that eventually found their way into the book. A 1977 symposium called Pen to Press, jointly sponsored by Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland, set me thinking about Tyndall. The following year, two conferences on Thomas More, one at UCLA and the other in Washington, made me plunge obsessively into the works and the life of that remarkable figure. Even the term obsessively, though accurate enough, gives me more credit than I deserve. I remember coming to the UCLA conference straight from a vacation in Mexico where I had lost my eyeglasses and thinking that I would have to give the talk in the snorkel mask that I had had ground to my prescription. At the last minute, my glasses turned up, sparing me that particular piece of Kingsley Amos farce. However random the particular occasions were, there was in fact an underlying design but it was a design over which I exercise only partial control. This should hardly come as a surprise to me. One of the principles of the book is that the dream of autonomous agency, though intensely experienced and tenaciously embraced, is only a dream. I was finding my voice all right, but that voice could not float free of a powerful set of institutional, intellectual, and historical forces. On the contrary, those forces, experienced both in pleasure and pain, helped to give my voice its resonance and pushed me in directions I could not have anticipated. My initial impetus was this. When I was a Fulbright student at Cambridge reading for the 1579 to 1603 paper of the Tripos examination, I had been powerfully struck by the strangeness of Raleigh's long fragment, Ocean's Love to Cynthia. More precisely, I had been struck by what seemed to me an eerie resemblance between Raleigh's poem, with its tormented sense of a world and a self in pieces, and Eliot's wasteland. It was equivalent to the familiar perception that an element in an old master painting, the shadow on a wall, a reflection in a pier glass mirror, the swirling abstraction of a marble panel, is oddly like a piece of abstract expressionism. I want to underscore that my first response to Ocean to Cynthia was not historical curiosity, but the pleasurable experience of aesthetic wonder. I could not understand how it was possible for Raleigh's Lament from the 1590s to sound so much like a piece of high modernism. Out of this wonder came a desire to know. Why would Raleigh have written such a thing? And this question turned into a larger question. Why would a tough-minded Elizabethan courtier, monopolist, and adventurer have written poetry at all, let alone poetry that had the ring of a modernist experiment? 
the dissertation, and a few years later, the book in which I attempted an answer, focused on Raleigh's role playing, his sense of himself as a character in a fiction. Fallen from the queen's favor as a consequence of secretly marrying, he cast himself as Orlando Furioso, driven mad by disappointed love. He went so far as to stage a suicide attempt. He gave himself a scratch under his right pap, according to one Rye observer, and in the same spirit wrote anguished verses meant to display his state of distraction. And distraction, as Eliot, the astute student of Renaissance poetry understood, manifested itself in broken speech, twisted metaphors, bursts of grief. What had impressed me as, an uncan as uncannily contemporary then was a wily courtier's attempt to sound unstrung. The performance was not entirely fraudulent. Imprisoned in the tower by the enraged queen, Raleigh presumably did feel desperate. My interest was in the way he turned that desperation into a literary performance that was in turn part of a lifelong practice of staging himself. The practice only came to an end on the scaffold. He coolly examined the executioner's acts and delivered several, no doubt carefully rehearsed quips. Only then, and only then, laid his head down upon the block, stretched out his arms, and shouted, strike man. The aesthetic wonder that provoked this entire project did not vanish in the course of writing, but I did not attempt to make it part of my account. I simply drew upon it to intensify my engagement in the problem on which I was focusing. For the purposes of my book on Raleigh, I was content to describe the literary consequences of one remarkable person's dramatic sense of life. But I was left, but I was left with a lingering sense of dissatisfaction. For however unusual Raleigh was, and he struck contemporaries as well as me as a startling and unsettling human being, his career only made sense as part of a much larger cultural phenomenon that allowed a personality such as his full scope to express itself. Hence, when I sat down to write the essays for the English Institute and other conferences, I kept coming back to the question of what forces were at work in 16th century England that enabled individuals to conceive of themselves as malleable roles in life itself, as well as in writing. A fine 1968 essay by Thomas Green, The Flexibility of the Self in Renaissance Literature, provided some key orientation in the period's intellectual history. I found much to interest me as well in two books both published in 1965 by the French anthropologist and social theorist Jean Duvignon, Lecture Exquise d'une Sociologie du Comédien and Sociologie du Théâtre, Essai sur les, sur les Hommes Collectifs. I came upon Duvignon's work quite by accident as a result of a habit that has served me in good stead for years grazing in the library stacks for recently acquired books which had not yet been shelved in their final disciplinary resting places. On one of my aimless rambles, I took out Duvignon's Chabica, Mutation dans un village du Maghreb, which I eagerly read because I had recently been to Morocco. Then, struck by the book's power, I looked to see what else the author had written. Duvignon's theater studies emphasize the rigidity of medieval social, ro social roles, thereby providing me with a resonant contrast to the flexibility that Green had described. How was it possible, I asked myself, to get from a world in which court etiquette was so precise that it specified the person whose role it was to hold the basin when the king became seasick crossing the channel, to a world in which someone like Raleigh, shifting restlessly from one role to another, self-consciously constructed the phenomenon known as Raleigh. I felt, as I worked on the essays for the English Institute and other occasions, a growing sense of excitement. Not so much a governing idea as a feeling of something brewing. This feeling, before the actual difficulties of writing set in, has always been for me the happiest moment of the composition process. You become alert to everything including things that everyone, including you, had long regarded as boring or unimportant, and everything you encounter, however accidentally, seems potentially rich with significance. Things that all, things almost literally seem to leap off the page. I knew that the book would come together before I knew how it would. 
I knew it would have a strong governing theme before I had the words for that theme. I trusted the marvelous feeling of alertness because I trusted the energy that it would confer upon the act of writing. I believed then and now that only in the act of writing can one discover what one needs to say. Two factors of a very different kind greatly intensified this feeling. The first was the arrival at Berkeley in 1975 of Michel Foucault. I had, as it happens, read and been deeply impressed by madness and civilization, another fruit of my grazing. But I might have missed his visit on campus, on a campus, hmm, but I might have missed his visit to a campus whose size and impersonality always led me to hearing months after the event that someone or other had delivered a good or disastrous lecture. Foucault was not lecturing. But he was giving, a friend in the French department informed me, a small seminar on Zola. And as my teaching schedule left me free time, I decided to sit in on it. I had very little interest in Zola, but it turned out not to matter, since in the course of the semester, Foucault did not once, as far as I recall, mention his name. Instead, the seminar was on the successive transformations in the medieval Catholic Church of the concept of penance, from a once for all lifelong public status to a tariff system of penalties based upon the precise nature of the sin confessed to a complex sliding scale of penitential practices whose severity was determined by the sinner's inward assent or resistance to the sin he or she had committed. The priest's determination of the penitent's inward disposition depended upon a whole pastoral technology including the creation of special confessional booths for privacy and the writing of increasingly sophisticated manuals for confessors. I'm going to start, I'm going to reread the first part of that last sentence because there's a lot to unpack there, like a whole lot more than even normal in these sentences, which are themselves a lot. The priest's determination of the penitent's inward disposition depended upon a whole pastoral technology including the creation of special confessional booths for privacy and the writing of increasingly sophisticated manuals for confessors. These manuals were designed to teach priests how to elicit meaningful descriptions of psychological states. Indeed, Foucault argued, they helped to create the inner lives over which they assumed control. While at the same time, they taught the art of insinuation, so as to help confessors draw out even the most painful and embarrassing confessions without putting previously unimagined sins into the minds of the faithful. If you need to pause and unravel all the back and forth and different subject positions that are described and outlined in that chunk of that paragraph, now is a good time to pause and do that. Foucault's whole intellectual performance was thrilling. I had never heard anyone speak as he did for two hours at a time without pause. He was uninterested in questions. And with such extraordinary precision, elegance, and rigor, I would rush away filled with almost evangelical excitement. But when I attempted to recapitulate the argument to my friends, they inevitably looked thoroughly skeptical and resisted my urgings that they attend the next meeting. Mm. I lost my place. Mm. And they look, the, my, and they inevitably looked for, thoroughly skeptical and resisted my urgings that they attend the next meeting of the sparsely attended seminar. By one of those strange quirks of intellectual fashion, Foucault suddenly became hugely famous the following year. When he returned to Berkeley for his next visiting semester, there was, in place of the small classroom, an immense lecture hall whose cavernous space could still not accommodate the crowds who literally beat on the doors demanding a chance to listen to a complex and rather arid discourse in French about stoicism, if I remember correctly, that many of them could scarcely understand. What I found particularly compelling about the seminar I chanced to attend was Foucault's argument that the innermost experience of the individual, the feelings that lurk in the darkness, were not a kind of raw material subsequently worked on by social forces. Rather, they were called into being and shaped by the institution that claimed only to police them. The experiences were not for that reason inauthentic. Rather, he argued, the very conviction of authenticity 
was something that the institution, with its doctrines, its hierarchies, its architectural arrangements, its procedures, its conceptions of periodicity and discursive adequacy made possible. There was, in short, a deep, hidden, necessary relation between the sense of self and a social institution that claimed for itself the power to reward and to punish. This vision of the nature of the inner life was deeply pessimistic. The hidden place into which one might hope to retreat in order to escape a totalizing institution was itself created by that institution. But the pessimism seemed constructed around a small, irreducible core of hope. It was possible to see how it was done, and therefore it was in principle possible to see how it might be undone. This dream of undoing resonated for me because, like most Americans at the time, my life had been deeply affected by the war in Vietnam and by the protests in which I had participated. I should not exaggerate my involvement in these protests. I had not burned my draft card, strategically injured myself, or made plans to flee to Canada. I had managed to avoid the draft first through student deferments and then through a lucky quirk of the calendar. My army physical, which would have been the beginning of the slippery slope toward either combat or exile, was scheduled for a few days after my 26th birthday, when I was no longer legally eligible. During my first years as an assistant professor at the University of California, I marched and rather uncomfortably chanted slogans. I distributed leaflets and went to mass rallies. I held teach-ins and joined in endless public discussions of the nature of America's imperial power and the possibility of, sub of, of subverting it. In Berkeley, California, this constituted a very mild form of engagement, but it thoroughly conditioned my intellectual life. In the spring of 1975, the time that Foucault was changing my intellectual horizons, everything seemed to be up for grabs. President Richard Nixon had resigned the year before to be pardoned immediately by his successor, Gerald Ford. Many of Nixon's top associates faced indictment and imprisonment. Two attempts had been made to assassinate President Ford. On April 30th, 1975, US forces withdrew from Saigon the image of people scrambling madly to reach the evacuation helicopters has remained indelibly ingrained in my memory, leaving the city to the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese. The years that followed seemed wildly unstable. The uprising in Soweto was violently crushed. The United States decided to fund the neutron bomb designed to kill all living creatures but leave the buildings intact. The Shah fled Iran and was replaced by the Ayatollah Khomeini, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. The Three Mile Island nuclear power plant had a partial meltdown. Perhaps I can convey the strangeness of these times by recalling that one of my favorite Berkeley students, she had taken a course of mine in which Moore's utopia figured prominently, came to see me in 1977 and told me that she was dropping out in order to join a real utopian community, one founded by a charismatic social radical in San Francisco, Jim Jones. As a farewell gift, she gave me a copy of a compelling, nightmarish novel by Kobo Abe, The Face of Another, that I still have on my shelf. The next year, I saw her name on a list of those who had committed suicide or been murdered in Jonestown. When I now read Renaissance self-fashioning, I perceive throughout the book many traces of this prof profoundly disorienting time. They are evident in my vision of an immense, malevolent force determined to crush all resistance. In my account of the targeting of aliens and the manipulation of their perceived threat as an excuse for the consolidation of power. In my disquieting perception that those who oppose this power recapitulate some of its most salient characteristics. Many of the anecdotes with which I attempt to illuminate Renaissance texts had a special contemporary resonance. To take a single example, the burning of the village in Sierra Leone with which I begin the chapter on Marlowe would at the time have inevitably evoked the famous television images of American soldiers lighting the thatch roofs of Vietnamese villagers' hutch. Does it still have this association a quarter of a century later? I do not know. But the passion with which I seized upon the story and wove it into my account of Tamburlaine was directly shaped by the queasy historical moment. The generational insurrection in which I was participating is evident too in what seems to me the book's surprising current of optimism. 
why should it be surprising? Because Renaissance self-fashioning has often been characterized as, char characterized as a grimly pessimistic account of the containment of subversion, a sour recognition that what looks like free choice is actually institutionally determined, a disenchanted acknowledgement of the impossibility of apocalyptic change. There is subversion, no end of subversion, but not, only not for us. It is true that the end of the war did not usher in the millennium. The year that my book came out was the year that Ronald Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter. And it is true that I saw no easy, uncontaminated stance of opposition. Even Marlowe's blasphemy, I argued, has something of the quality of submission. But coursing through these chapters is an eradicable principle of hope. Hope in many different forms, often crushed, but then springing up again in spite of everything. The somewhat perplexed declaration of faith voiced in the book's epilogue is not, I think, an anomaly. It is recognition of a secret confidence that made the writing of this book not grim, but joyful. I believed that the ragged forces standing up to raw military power would ultimately triumph. And I believed that in describing some of the mechanisms of identity formation in the Renaissance, I was participating in a small scholarly way in a much larger project project of grasping how we have become the way we are. The project was not merely descriptive. The goal was to enable us to escape what we detest and embrace whatever brings us wonder, hope, and pleasure. That pleasure for me included, and still includes, the aesthetic delight that is the vital source of my energy as a writer. <laughs>